Welcome to episode 120 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with educator and author Regie Routman about three things that she's passionate about, engagement, excellence, and equity. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. So having Regi Routman on Truth For Teachers for me is like a tennis player getting to interview Serena Williams. Regi is probably among the top five people who have influenced my teaching practice and my teaching philosophy. She's had over 40 years of experience teaching and coaching and leading in diverse schools across the United States and Canada, and she's been publishing books since 1988. Her current work, and check this out, it's so cool, her current work involves week-long school residencies where she does daily demonstration teaching in K-6 to classrooms, and she coaches teachers and, teachers and principals. She also facilitates ongoing professional conversations in the schools and even beyond. And all of this is with the goal of creating whole school change, particularly around reading and writing. So I'm going to let you listen in on this interview right at the part where I'm telling Regie about when I first encountered her work. So I, I first read your book, Reading Essentials, um, back around, around 2003, 2004, right pretty soon after it came out. And it was the first education book that I had read that had promoted this idea that teachers are human beings with real feelings and interests and preferences that should be shared with students. And I mean, that's become a much more popular idea in recent years, of course, but I don't recall hearing anything like that in my own practice a decade and a half ago. So for me, you were sort of the pioneer of this idea that we should share our reading and writing practices with students, and we should model our literacy instruction around authentic ways that real people in real life do. And honestly, that had never really occurred to me until I had read your book. And then when we were emailing back and forth about the topic of this podcast, you wrote something about this that I thought was really key. And you wrote, I think that the notion of authenticity, who we are, how we present ourselves, what we ask kids to do, how we treat those we work with, and who the audience for, that's the work, that's the key to whole school achievement. And I loved that you said that. And ever since then, I've been wanting to find out a little bit more about what you mean by that. So can you tell us a little bit about authenticity? Yeah, that's a great question, Angela. And um, it's I think it's um, it's not just authenticity in um, teaching. I think it's authenticity in living. I sometimes think that, you know, we talk about literacy essentials, but it's really literacy and life essentials. I think that how we present ourselves to students, um, the power that we share with them in the classroom or not, um, whether our emphasis is on um, putting students first, not standards or passing tests, and staying true to what we know is um, right, um, best, most principled practices um, for students, for teaching, for learning. And that includes more than just the content. It it includes the way we um, the way we treat people, um, including all all members of a school building, from the custodian to the secretary. Um, That culture, that authentic culture, sets the tone for whether or not this is going to be um, a high achieving school. I have never actually seen a high achieving school um, where there is a lack of authenticity. Um, and by that, I mean, you can get the high test scores for a while by, by just teaching skills. You can get kids to go up, Mm -hmm. but to get that sustained learning where kids love learning, um, I think you have to have that, that culture of authenticity and not be afraid to fail. I think that, you know, we're modeling ourselves, not just as readers and writers and thinkers, but also as risk takers, um, as people who have real lives, um, I'll never forget recently talking about authenticity when I was teaching uh, in a classroom and the lesson wasn't going very well. And I had something like 40 people observing um, in addition to the, I know. And so, you know, the the, the co-teacher, the classroom teacher and I had planned the lesson and these kids were just not engaged. I didn't know why they weren't engaged, but I said in front of all these people and the kids, I said something like, kids, this isn't, this isn't going very well. I don't have your attention and you're not interested. And so 
that's not your fault. Um, so we're going to change gears. And what was fascinating to me at the end of the week when I got the evaluations from the teachers in terms of what impacted them and what they learned, it was like almost to a person that I gave myself permission to fail and to change gears because I was um, noticing what was best for kids. And this was just a waste of time. It had never occurred to them that they could abandon the lesson. And so I think, you know, that's part of it. And showing kids that, you know, we mess up and showing teachers um, that we mess up. And I think a big part of that is, um, is, is, living, is living full lives. Um, and for me, that means, you know, um, the reading and the writing that I do, um, that it's real, you know, that I bring in the books that I'm reading. Um, I show the writing that I'm doing. And it doesn't have to be, you know, that you're writing a book, but it could be just showing kids how you struggled with that um, communication to parents. You didn't just write it straight out because you cared about the audience. So that that kind of authenticity, um, and it's everything. It's just, and, and you know, I know we'll be weaving it through the through this interview today, but that's a it's a great way to start actually because um, I do think it's everything, and it's how you get. Um, a trusting, collaborative, um, respectful school culture. I think this talk about authenticity leads us right into the heart of what we're going to talk about today, which is the essentials of engagement, excellence, and equity. And that's really the focus of your new book that's coming out. Um, So I want to go through and talk about each one of these principles, engagement, excellence, and equity. And I want to start with engagement. Can you talk to us about that first? Yeah, I think that's huge. It actually goes back to that, you know, that lesson where the kids were not engaged. And so I abandoned it. And the engagement has to be, and I think this is something that we really miss for um, students of color that are in high poverty schools. We sort of scam them with, you know, programs and um, Chromebooks and, and technology and don't give them, you know, the authentic, um, the best literature, the authentic um, materials, the best literature, the best teachers. Um, so we have to engage um, hearts and minds. I, I've often said that, you know, nobody ever talks about mind and heart. It's always heart and mind. And that's from getting to know the people that you're working with, teachers as well as students, Um And the the whole first section of my book is really about establishing a trusting, safe, joyful, intellectual school culture where everyone's voice is heard and where the culture is one of our students, not my students. And what I have found in over 45 years of teaching, you know, almost exclusively in schools where students are underperforming, and that can mean uh, affluent uh, populations too. I think schools are underperforming because the test scores are good. And so teachers can sometimes not be working as hard as many of the teachers in in the high poverty schools, underperforming schools. Um, That whole school, high achievement requires a thriving culture. That's huge. And so it's the physical culture, you know, the way the room is arranged, having the kids have some say in it, giving them choices, the way people treat each other, that it's a culture of kindness, not a culture of bullying, that parents feel safe and welcome. And this is where um, I think honoring um, kids' stories is so important. One of the unique things about this book, Angela, is, um, and I've never done this before, but I have more than a dozen personal stories, um, and they're professional stories as well, because they're stories of things that have happened in my life that I have connected to my teaching, that when I'm in the classroom, I'm not just a teacher, I'm a person living in the world trying to live an authentic life, just the way we started. And so Mm -hmm. I always start with a story, and it might be a picture book, it might be a story um, about my granddaughters. um, And, you know, the only way that I can reach them is, is to get engaged in social media. That's where they are. They're not on the phone, they're not on email. And, you know, telling those stories and, um, and honoring them and making sure that kids' stories are valued and heard, their culture, um, their their names, um, their backgrounds, their families. And I think that goes a long way in engaging kids. Um, A big part of the work that I do, and certainly in in engagement, is about celebration. Celebrating um, 
the kids' strengths. And I think that goes way back to my reading recovery training so many decades ago, where if the child could only write the first letter of his first name, what you wrote on the evaluation was, <laughs> he can write the first letter of his first name. And you didn't write all the things that he couldn't do. That was a revelation to me because I was really good mm -hmm. at finding the deficits. And that changed my mm -hmm. mindset. And so I really talk more about a positive mindset than a growth mindset. I really think you can have a growth mindset and believe all kids can learn, but your expectations can be so low that um, they don't they don't get to where they need to be. So having that positive mindset, um, seeing all of stu students as capable, and then giving them really um, relevant, challenging, authentic work to do. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the kind of thinking that we ask kids to do, and why is it that if you're in a high poverty school and the kids are underperforming, you don't ask them to think deeply. You know, the kids are pulled out of the classroom at skills in isolation. And yet, if we're not teaching them to think deeply and, and, and think um, divergently and come up with original ideas, we're doing them a terrible disservice. You know, we have 40% of our, and this is the equity part. I mean, it all goes together. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's move into the equity piece now, because I, I like where you're going with this. Well, I think that um, the equity piece is everything because we're underserving we're underserving our kids, so we can tie it all together with that. And um, equity um, is really about equalizing educational opportunity for every student. Um, I like what Pedro Nogueira says. He says, and this is a quote, I heard him say it, equality and equity are not the same. Giving everyone a shoe is equality. Making sure the shoe fits is equity. So I think, you know, um, we provide lots of resources, even in schools where the kids aren't doing very well, but we're not giving them a challenging and viable curriculum. We're not moving beyond compliance and complacency and excuses um, in a lot of places. Um, one of the stories I tell in the book, and I've told it before, is when my dad spent a number of years um, in, a, in a nursing home, actually the last eight years of his life. For most of that time, his mind was fine, but he was physically disabled. And because he didn't look smart, um, the conversation that he that they tried to engage him in, he knew it was ridiculous. I was reading him articles from the New York Times, and he would and then stopping and having him fill in a word. He still had a sense of humor, but it was assumed that he wasn't capable, and so the expectations were very low in terms of, of what they expected him to do. And so he didn't do um, very much. And they were shocked, the people at the nursing home, that um, he, was, he was able to tell a joke. He was able to understand an article in the newspaper. I had to show them. And I do the same thing in, in underperforming schools. When I go into a classroom, I don't know the kids. I don't know their names. I don't know who supposedly has a disability or a label. And I tell the mm -hmm. teachers, don't tell me who they are and do not remove these students. Sometimes I, I'll be told when I get to a school, well, we've taken out this one and this one because they're, they're severe behavior problems. No, if, if every, on every single student in the room, um, if the behavior is that severe, which I have almost never seen, there's usually there would be an aid. But, you know, when we, when we have relevant, when we present ourselves authentically, we have stories to tell, we want to hear kids' stories, we honor those stories. The kids, you know, they're just eating out of your hand. And sometimes I think we just bore kids because we move so slowly. We teach all this sometimes, I don't want to say the word uh, garbage, I shouldn't be saying, but we teach <laughs> this stuff that's, that they're, that's really disrespectful to them, mm. um, that we have to assume that every child is intelligent. And, the, and what happens is the kid, the teachers that are observing when I'm working in a classroom, um, are shocked sometimes at what kids are able to do. And they'll say to me later, I didn't know he could do that. And I'll say, well, I didn't know he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that, I think, um, the part of the equity is, is high expectations. Um, it's a lot of um, conversation, not, not talking at kids. And, and you've written about this yourself, Angela, and you're, that's an area of expertise for you as well. How do we 
you know, share the power in the classroom so that we hear kids' voices, that they are involved in deep conversations that are all student-led, that we're um, giving them first-rate resources. I'll never forget a school that I worked in a couple of years ago. Um, it was a very poor school, and the test scores were terrible. And I was there to teach um, writing. But I happened to notice, I said, when I know, went, went around the school, there were no libraries. Well, that was, that's the first thing I looked for. I said, where are the classroom libraries? And they said, well, we've invested in, um, they had invested in Chromebooks for everybody. And they had some kind of a canned program and the kids were moving through levels hmm. and they had spent all this money. So it's, it's not about money. It's about how the money is spent. And the teachers really didn't know anything about teaching reading and the kids reading was terrible <laughs> because they were just being tested on literal comprehension on, on books that were not really books. And so what is that about? That's about very, very low expectations. And so somehow we've made it okay in some schools, kind of like in the nursing home um, where my dad was, just to keep kids breathing, just mm. to check to see if they have a pulse. Mm -hmm. But nothing's really, really happens. And honestly, Angela, it, it keeps me up at night, this whole equity thing. And I'm just dedicated to doing whatever I can as one individual um, to make it possible for more, for all of our students to, you know, to be successful as learners. I never think of them as well. They're only, they're only reading on, you know, the second grade level. So I can't read this. I can't use big words. That's nonsense. You, I learned from uh, New Zealand educator Don Haldaway many, many decades ago. He's probably my my most esteemed beloved mentor that you have to um, read wonderful literature the best that you can find and not worry about do they understand every single word they need to hear the cadence and the language they need to love the stories fall in love with authors and they're going to get this we move so slowly sometimes in the um, in, in most of the schools that I work in that, you know, it's no wonder they're bored and they're not engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think a big thing about equity, too, is we have to teach kids um, that we teach them to learn how to learn. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that is huge. I mean, it's what you and I do. I'm reading the newspaper and, and I think what all smart inquiring people do. I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm, I'm reading research articles. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading mostly actually, uh, nonfiction books. Right now I'm reading Tahisi Coates' new book on... Eight Years We Were in Power? Yes. Are you reading yes. that? No, I read his first book, but um, I definitely want to get that. I've heard amazing things. You're it's enjoying it? fascinating. Well, what I, okay. what I love about it, I heard him on Charlie Rose. He was interviewed a few weeks ago. That's mm -hmm. part of my real life, too. I like Charlie Rose because I like <laughs> the interviews like we're doing because you get to know the people and what they're thinking. And mm -hmm. his thinking is so different than anyone else is thinking about race relations and why we're at the place that we're in and what we need to do. And, and he's such a brilliant writer. His, his work is just a pleasure to read. And this is true. You know, I find the best nonfiction is, um, is narrative nonfiction. And um, all good writers are, are big readers. And why we think that we can teach writing and not be readers ourselves is crazy. Um, that whole reading, writing connection is a big part of my book. You can't be a writer if you're not a reader. And one of the reasons that Coates is such a great writer is he's read everything, you know, and, and this is true for really all good writers. And then using that in the classroom um, for all levels, all subjects, you know, what do you notice that this writer did? I mean, this Coates book is not easy reading. And I'm, I'm like hanging on every word because he's such a good writer. And I think that's what we want, you know, for our kids. So I bring in what I'm reading. I could bring that book in even to, you know, an elementary school class and say, here's why I chose this and owe them my reading log and, and, um, and how I have books stacked up. I always know kind of, you know, what I'm going to be um, reading next. And I'm always, I'm always in bookstores and, and so replicating that in the classroom, you know, with wonderful classroom libraries, having the kids, um, set that up, um, make the labels for the sections, no leveled books in the classroom library. People are sometimes shocked by that, but I'm horrified when I see leveled books in the classroom library. You can level books for, um, for a guided reading group. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but kids need to, we have to teach them how to choose books. It needs to work the way mm -hmm. the 
public library works in the real world. Nobody tells you when you walk in, you're not allowed in that section because you're not a good enough reader. And so um, mm-hmm. setting up the classroom like that and having the kids, um, in fact, I, I know I did that in, um, in reading essentials and might, and might've been one of the first persons to do that, but actually taking the books that were in the room, putting them on the floor, having kids sort them as to, um, you know, how they wanted their library organized. I've been in classrooms where teachers have a thousand books in the classroom and the kids don't know what's there because it's the teacher's library. So a lot of this is about sharing the power. And that's the equity part part too, um, Angela, is that we want kids that are self-determining learners. They know how to learn. They know how to self-monitor. They know how, you know, to go to the library and pick, pick out something that not only that they're interested, but they actually can read it with, with comprehension because they're self-monitoring, they're self-correcting, um, that they that we've helped them find their passions. When I go into a school, they kids know that I'm passionate. This is my work. I am passionate about making things better for kids. You know, but I also talk about I'm passionate about cooking for my husband. I can tell you what I'm making for dinner tonight. I love to cook. You know, and um, and that's part of my reading recipes, um, and it's also you know my relaxation, and also part of being kind of an authentic person. Years ago, a colleague said, um, if you in teaching just in isolated pieces like just phonics in isolations, grammar in isolation, um, we actually make it harder for kids. It's like putting the pieces of let's say a hundred piece puzzle on the table in front of a student, but never showing them the lid of the box. So they don't get how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. And so with whole part whole, they always knowing you can, you can teach your phonics in isolation, but it's going to be coming from a text that you've written together that is connected to what's going on in the classroom or connected to the study. And, and for those few kids that need to have that um, isolated teaching, you know, really kind of drilled in that's a very small percentage unfortunately Mm -hmm. we give you know we do a lot of that drill drill skill and kill to kids that don't need that and and it's so inefficient because they never get to the good stuff i've never failed to teach a i've never had a kid that i couldn't teach how to read never um and it's not just because i'm trained as a reader i find out what they're passionate about you know people that were labeled um Uh, dyslexic, like Einstein, like Nelson Rockefeller, learned to read because of their passion. They had to read this book. They had to have that information. And we have to do the same thing in the classroom. The other thing that happens that we haven't talked about is um, a big part of my work and a big part of this book is is, it's about joy. It's about joy in learning. Um, I think one of the things that, that, that teachers always comment on is when I work in schools is You were happy. (laughs) You had a good time with the kids. I love that work. I think I'm at my truest self when I'm in the classroom working with kids. Um, And they're not joyful. And that is so sad. Um, And so we have to find a way to, and this is why I talk about how important it is to be authentic and have your own life, because if you don't, you're not happy to be in that classroom. You know, you can't be taking home, you know, two, three hours worth of papers at night. And, you know, I mean, I'm married a long time, like over 50 years to the same wonderful person. I consider myself very fortunate. But part of that is, is I work really hard, but I don't work all the time. You know, otherwise I wouldn't Mm -hmm. still be married to this wonderful person. That balance. And you know what I remember from meeting you at the ASCD conference in Houston and I remember you were presenting and I asked you, I said, so where are you going after this? Thinking you were going to tell me about the next conference. And you looked at me and you were like, I'm going home. I'm going to spend time with my husband. And I was like, how crazy. That is amazing. I love to hear that. There are so many people who, um, you know, are on the road all the time or just, you know, work of any sort, including teaching can be all consuming. And, um, you know, this just ties right back into everything that you've said about, if you're going to be joyful, if you're going to bring a whole person into the classroom, you have to have a life outside of that classroom too. It's hard to do because you and I are as dedicated as anybody, right? But, you know, I've never seen any research that showed that teachers that stayed at school the longest or put the most red marks reading people's paper, you know, that achievement went up, that the happiness quotient went up for anybody. 
That's right. So it, it is, it is a balance. And I think when you come into the um, classroom joyful, that makes a huge difference. I'll tell you this too, in the cultures where, um, what I consider a thriving school culture, where there's a high level of trust, it's an intellectual culture, everyone's voice is being heard. These are happy places and people don't want to leave where, um, that is not typical. Um, and, you know, and it should be typical. You know, I think we're putting, we put so much on, on teachers, um, that it, it makes it almost impossible sometimes for them just to teach because of all of the, you know, all of the demands. How does all of this tie into that third piece of the excellence piece? I think we have to develop a, of what John, John Hattie calls um, a collaborative expertise, a culture of collaborative expertise, and that's professional learning that's going on weekly. The schools that I work in where we have this, there's a um, leadership team, um, there is um, ongoing professional learning where the whole school meets together um, once a month in vertical teams. Um, and and they're using either materials that I've developed or they're doing professional reading. They are analyzing um, student writing that's going on in the building. They are looking at how they're teaching guided reading and why, why are things not working so well? And there's no blame. It's again, it's like, these are our students, mm-hmm. not just my student. Um, there's no shortcut for that. And yet professional learning doesn't happen very much. I think, you know, expert teaching cannot be downloaded. Um, I look at excellence. It's the notion of curriculum is everything that we do and say and how we act. It's not just the content, but the curriculum has to be, um, what I was talking about before, connected to, um, connected to the real world, connected to politics, um, hunger, um, you know, look what's going on in, in Puerto Rico. I, I, I've read an article today. I just have to tell you this. If I, I'm from New York, and so I, we get the Seattle Times, and, but I read the New York Times every morning as well. And this morning, there was just an amazing article about this one chef, I think from California, that has literally fed, fed hundreds of thousands of people in Puerto Rico because the federal effort was badly lacking, mm-hmm. as you know. And just that whole notion that one person can make mm-hmm. a difference because um, he knows how to do it. He knew how to organize people um, and he cared mm-hmm. so much, you know. So what does that mean for the classroom? You know, I would take that article and and in high school and, and um, you know, project it, have the kids read it and talk about it. What did he do? What does this mean for your life? Like what, you know, what could you do? Um, so... I think for the excellence part for me, it's not just, it's the deep thinking part. I, and, I, and what my book, what I have in my book basically is I have the research, all the research, plus all of my teaching experiences and colleagues' experiences. But then I also have it, probably more than 50% of the book. Okay, so how do you apply these um, most principled ideas? What is that? What do you do in the classroom? What do you do in your school? So in detail, I really show show the reader, the teacher, the leader, um, this is what you can do. This is how you can get your parents on board. This, this is a big section on English language learners. We have to, we have to value bilingual education and, and other languages and, and not penalize kids. Um, so all of that is connected. I'd actually, I'm guessing Angela, we're out of time. And I, um, you had asked me if I would close with something, um, memorable and so i was thinking about that yeah go ahead let's hear your takeaway truth <laughs> okay so my takeaway and that's why I, it's it's a it's not real fast but mm-hmm. but i was thinking about that this was really important that joy is a necessity that all kids can learn and so i wanted to mm. read you this i interviewed a high school junior um and this is in my book and what she and she's talking about um, one of the teachers that she had, and this is what she said, I didn't even realize how much I was learning. She was super attentive to every student, constantly reassuring us that we could do the work, even when we thought we couldn't. She was patient with everyone. She took time to explain things until we understood them. She gave us time to talk and work in small groups. In other classes, I felt like I was sometimes bothering the teacher when I asked a question, but not with Mrs. B. She never not even once made anyone feel stupid for asking a question, 
even if it was an obvious one, there was no sarcasm, no targeting, no blaming a student for not knowing. She would just patiently explain whatever was being asked, made sure everyone understood. I never had a teacher who did that before. I remember right before finals, she gave us a talk and she said, I care way more about you as people than what your grades are. She helped me feel connected to her way beyond just being a student in her class trying to get a good grade. I didn't realize until months after school was over how much I'd learned from her and what a great teacher she was. But now I know, and I'll never forget her. And for me, that high school student speaks to the power and the obligation we have to ensure that every student we teach is treated with dignity, respect, intelligence, and that we advocate for engagement, excellence, and equity for all each one of them. And this student also reminds us that we teachers matter in ways that we cannot always know at the time, that our caring, our fairness, our expertise, and our kindness are not forgotten. I love Rigi's takeaway truth. Joy is a necessity that all kids can learn. You can go to stenhouse.com slash literacy essentials to get free resources related to Regie's new book. It's called Literacy Essentials, Engagement, Excellence, and Equity for All Learners. I hope you'll check the book out. Have a fantastic week. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Want more than just a weekly podcast episode from me? I'd love to also send you a weekly message of encouragement via email. I'll reach out each Sunday evening with a short message that's designed to help you feel more prepared and inspired and motivated for the week ahead. It's not a newsletter or a bunch of announcements. This goes out to over 85,000 educators. So I put just as much thought into crafting this weekly written message to my email list as I do into crafting my podcast episodes and it's entirely unique content that you won't find anywhere else online. Just go to thecornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe and you can sign up. That's thecornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe.